four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. Ooh, almost made it to 20. OK, well, we'll see. I'll give you all the uh, final exam answers today, obviously. Um, OK, logistical stuff. First things first. Uh, most of you, hopefully, I'm sorry about the confusion with turnitin.com. Most of you have probably submitted your briefings on Canvas. That's a good thing. Um, <laughs> I will we'll send out instructions later today on uh, the peer grading. Uh, more or less, you'll get three uh, papers to grade like before. Uh, we'll make a couple changes. The first one, which I will, of course, repeat on email for the other uh, seven, no, 60 students. The first one is that uh, when you put, uh, when you do the peer grading, uh, which will probably be due next Tuesday, when you do the peer grading, you will not put a grade inside the document. What you'll do is you'll say, you'll write a minimum number of words. There was a problem with word count before. You'll write a minimum number of words, and uh, which will be like 300 words, feedback on the briefings, and then you will uh, put the correct file naming information, which again will be on the email, and then you're going to put the, each of these three feedback reports into a folder. One folder will be A, that's your rank A, briefing to uh, feedback folder A, briefing to feedback folder B, briefing to feedback folder C, and that means that the, each of the folders will co correspond to the rank grade that you have given to the paper, the paper that you read. Okay? There was a very big problem last time uh, in my mind, a very big problem of uh, essentially tit for tat grading, which I could draw a picture. I, I, we have all the data, we looked at it. Tit for tat grading in the sense that if, if uh, you know, everybody had to give an A, B, and C, right? You had to, you're forced to. Uh, but people who received a C rank from the peer review were more likely to give a C feedback to that person who gave that rank. Uh, and more than I would say is statistically normal. In the sense, if you give me a C, I will punish you and give you a C, regardless of the quality of your feedback, which is, of course, wrong. Uh, if you give me an A, by the way, I'll give you an A, regardless of the quality of your feedback, right? So on the, on the one hand, that balanced out. Uh, on the other, it, was, uh, it left some people upset because they felt like they put in uh, a good amount of work in terms of the feedback, but then the actual grade determined the entire rating of their feedback. This, of course, is uh, very poor manners, not scholarly, uh, actually kind of kindergarten behavior. Uh, so what we're going to try and do the next time around is have the feedback go into a folder A, a folder B, and a folder C, which is basically going to be your rank A, rank B, rank C. Then the people reading your feedback will not even know what your rank is, and hopefully they'll be a little bit more honest about giving you the feedback that you deserve for your comments. The reason that we're doing the minimum word count is because some of the people who were giving review feedback on the briefings were very uh, lazy, and they only uh, gave a 50-word or 100-word uh, no-name, uh, no-nothing summary, sometimes apparently copied and pasted from one briefing to the next. Uh, and I would prefer if people would write something useful for the author of the briefing instead of uh, being lazy. So uh, sorry about those changes, but we're trying to adjust to make it uh, more fair for people who are working harder and uh, separate out quality work from non-quality work. We have plenty of seats up front. Come in the front. No, the back row is, is empty today. Some of you may have noticed that your grades are already posted for homework three. Most of the grades, as in over 90% of the grades were a five out of five. I gave uh, a fairly quick response to, uh, or I looked at them fairly quickly. Uh, it's difficult to grade homework when you have, um, you're just copying and pasting data from other websites. So uh, doing that correctly will get you five points. Some people didn't give me their student ID number. Some people actually screwed up the assignment and I had to go look up the data myself. They lost points. Um, I will give you some more uh, feedback on, on water pricing and supply and demand and so on next Thursday, a week from now, uh, because I need more time to look at the data. I'm grading this, so, I don't, so it's not Hossein, and I have too many things going on. So I'm going to try and get that done uh, and give you feedback. Uh, I will take a, I have to say it, we're not sitting in the back row today, Mailing. 
I have to take a little bit more time, it must be said, to look at your comments in terms of what's the impact of temperature and precipitation on supply and demand. Uh, most of the time, your comments were correct or, or reasonable. Uh, some people made incorrect comments, uh, just you know, getting the, the causality wrong. If the temperature is hot, the demand is going to go up kind of thing. If you say demand goes down when the temperature is hot, that's not exactly the good way to talk about water uh, demand. So uh, unfortunately, what this means is that as I go back and I look at this further, I might adjust some people's grades because I realize that they've made a mistake in what they've said. Uh, I hope that's not your case, uh, but don't be surprised if that happens. I, I, I guess it might happen for a few people. Um, but what I'll look at is, is the uh, information you gave, and I'll wor do some analysis and, and show uh, the, con the correspondence between water prices uh, and uh, temperature and uh, consumption and so on. <clears throat> so that's going to be uh, next Thursday. The reason it's next Thursday, as I remind you, is there is no class next Tuesday. So uh, enjoy sleeping in next Tuesday morning. Um, I did not grade the bonus homework assignment, so that's why that's not showing up. It will show up for people who did that assignment in a reasonably good manner. It will show up uh, also by next week. So don't worry if you did the bonus assignment. Uh, you'll still have a chance to get it. All right. Um, any questions on the briefing or other things uh, that have been talked about or you just thought about on your way over here on the bus or your parents asked you about and they said, oh, you're learning economics, tell me about whatever. Anything? Any questions? Okay. Um, today I want to talk about uh, uh, I want to talk about the stuff that you probably needed to know when you did your briefing, uh, which is uh, economic uh, using uh, price or mar market mechanisms as compared to regulatory mechanisms to uh, address environmental issues uh, and uh, uh, resource consumption. I'm going to talk about this because it seemed like the people who came to my office hours were a little bit confused about some of the options that were available in the briefing. Uh, this is going to be, in some ways, too late for people who wrote briefings, but not too late for people who are grading briefings. And uh, I, I need to do this now because uh, it's going to be useful in terms of talking about environmental uh, policies and so on, but also because um, uh, it's kind of useful for you to do your briefing and take your best, best shot at a policy recommendation and then hear me talk about the policy recommendation after. One reason this is useful is because uh, it helps you understand the difference between what you said and what I said, uh, and potentially uh, uh, we'll both be right. I don't have any problem with that. And the other one is, is that these briefing assignments are off, I often uh, uh, give these briefing assignments and blog posts and so on because people come up with interesting ideas uh, from their own background that are not, oh, the professor said this, and so I'll say that. That'll get me a good grade. I don't like people who say, oh, because you said so, that's why I gave that answer. I want you to be thinking about different ways of doing things, and the briefing, in a sense, gave you the opportunity to do that. Uh, and now I'll talk a little bit more about the conventional way of discussing these issues, or these policies. And then you can see, uh, number one, if your idea fit in there, uh, or your ideas fit in there, and number two, if they didn't, uh, if that was a good thing or a bad thing, let's say, right? Because what we want is to make sure that when you propose an economic policy, uh, that you're using the right, you're, 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 you're working with incentives in the right way, for example. And then uh, as this goes on, uh, and, and if you're sitting here listening to me and you say, oh my God, I wrote this, it's okay if you want to say, ask a question uh, during this uh, lecture, during this uh, period, if you want to ask a question saying, not necessarily, I said this, am I right, okay, but how would this work? Would this fit into what you're talking about? Uh, and that's because uh, diff there's different ways of, of working these ideas, and I'm not, certainly not going to cover all of them. There's lots of different ways of doing it. So let's, let's start with the basic idea uh, in the briefing, just to get that over with, uh, which is that when it comes down to a government policy to uh, uh, affect or reduce the consumption of resources. Uh, there's, there's, and, and also, so let's talk about policy. To policy, 
regulation. Oh, it's going to be really small chalk day today. Crap. Policy, emergency chalk. Okay. So we've got policy. What does that mean? This is a big question for a lot of people. Uh, regulation. Prices. Markets. Okay. In general, we'll talk about that. And then... Uh, I want to get into this with respect to uh, resources and the environment. There's no I in their environment. Come on down. Why, why are people coming in after the, after the half hour? I know. I was on the bus also, and I got diverted. But I guess you were just on time arrival. 15 minutes longer or something like that. It's ridiculous. Hopefully, did somebody, what happened there? What happened on the, whatever that, hill? No? Maybe they're shooting a movie. The hills of Burnaby. There was an accident, a crazy accident. Because they closed the whole road. Not crazy? That was a small accident. I, I'd hate to see a big accident. Okay, so look, the word policy, the word policy is a very vague word. It means almost anything, okay? The government has a policy. The government has a policy about marriage. The government has a policy about trade. The government has a policy about uh, uh, bottled water, okay? A policy is just a, um, an idea, a set of go uh, uh, a goal, uh, and policies can be uh, uh, promoted and advanced in many different ways. You can advance a policy by making a law, saying our policy is that people who are under uh, 18 years old should not drink alcohol. So we're going to make a law saying you can't drink alcohol. And we're going to make a regulation that says that a bar uh, must check your ID, in fact two IDs, which is the Canadian version of this. You have to have two pieces of ID for them to check your uh, age to make sure that you're not under 18 years old in the bar or in the liquor store or whatever. So a policy can lead to a regulation. Uh, a, p a policy can lead to a law that says uh, we're going to put a uh, limit on the number of cars on the streets. A policy can put uh, a law into place that says if you want to have a car, you have to pay a registration fee of $500 or $5,000. Uh, or in the case of Singapore, $50,000 you have to have for a licensing fee for a car. So there's lots of different things that can happen under, under a policy. It's a very vague word. And in the, in the briefing, a lot of people appear to misunderstand policy or think that a policy, uh, am I going to have a policy or am, or am I going to have a law? Right? But a policy, laws are included in policies. Regulations are included in policies. Markets are not necessarily included in policies, but the government can create the conditions which leads to a market. Okay, and I'll get to that. That's the, if the government says you have to register a car, then you have to have it registered. If you want to buy or sell your car, you can buy or sell it to a, uh, another person in a market, but then they have to move the, the registration of the car to the new owner, and that's part of the, the law or the policy. Right? So markets and governments, they interact together, and government policies affect markets, but they don't necessarily make them. In the case that I'll talk about later about the environment, they certainly do make them. The government can make the market and that's what I asked you to do in the briefing. For those of you who showed up a little bit late, uh, the, I'm going to talk a lot about the, number one, your homework is, is graded. Number two, that grade might fall. Number three, the briefing, uh, the, the bonus points will show up later. And I'll talk about water, and there's no class on Tuesday. Okay, I'm not going to summarize it again. So, um, regulation. If you have, in the, in, in, the, in the briefing, the one thing that you should not have done is said, the government is going to make a regulation not allowing uh, coal to be burned, for example. Except if you had gone on further to talk about prices or markets. If you just say, no coal being burned, congratulations, that's not the briefing. Okay? You should get a low ranking for that. What I want is a regulation that will allow some form of flexibility, will change the incentives in some way, so that prices or markets are allowed to emerge or expected to emerge to change the, 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 the frequency of 
of, uh, or the, 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 the rate of, of consumption of resources or the environmental conditions. So if the government says, uh, we want less coal to be burned, and therefore we're going to put a tax on a ton of coal, that's okay, right? That is a government policy that creates a tax that is a form of a price incentive for less coal to be burned. That's perfectly fine as a response to the first half of the briefing question. Secondly, um, so, that's, so that's what I wanted when I talked about the briefing. I don't, I don't want a command and control kind of policy. I want a policy that is coming from the government, but that's going to give people incentives to change their behavior that are more flexible in terms of pricing. If you're allowed to spend more money and avoid the, the, the policy, that's okay, right? If the government says uh, our policy is going to be, uh, so the, if you get to the environmental thing, we're worried about air pollution, so our policy is going to be uh, you can't drive your cars, that is a policy, it is a regulation, it is not the correct answer to what I was trying to get at, right? If we say we're going to have, uh, uh, you have to have a car permit to drive your car around, and there are, uh, there's one permit for every two cars, and we're going to sell those permits, that is a policy that is going to reduce the number of cars being driven around, and it's going to use a market or a price mechanism. That is okay. That is good. Is that clear? Nodding, nodding, nodding. Any shaking heads? No clear? Not what I wrote. Crap. Okay, well, we'll find out on the, on the grading uh, of the briefing. Uh, just as a side note, by the way, I am going to ask, you okay? Okay. I'm going to ask uh, you in an email if you uh, like your briefing and you think I will like your briefing and that you think I might want to put the briefing on the blog as a separate item because you wrote a good briefing, then you can send that to me either from the last briefing or for the one to come, the one that you just did. Uh, and I say that because I don't have the opportunity to read all the briefings and I've tried to read some of the higher graded briefings and the lower graded briefings, the CCC and the AAA. Um, on the last time around, but the, because the grading was a little bit more noisy than I would have wanted, uh, I wasn't sure that the AAA and the CCC were respectively the best and the worst, right? Um, so if you feel like, hey, I've got a good briefing and I worked hard on it, which is what I've heard a lot, uh, and you know, I want people to know about this briefing besides my mother, uh, then you can send it to me, right? You know, uh, Chris said, oh, send me a link to the video from last week because I want to send it to my mom. So. That's why we have the videos. Uh, you guys can come up and do a song and dance at the end of the, of the semester and your mothers will look at the video. So, uh, but then you'll violate all your privacy, so don't come up uh, unless you sign something. So um, regulation, prices, markets. The, the resource question should have been fairly simple uh, in terms of uh, way, some way to do prices. It's more or less some form of a tax uh, if the government's gonna have a policy, whether it's about the consumption of water uh, the consumption of uh, land or the consumption of uh, 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 resources like non-renewable resources like coal um, or fuel. Uh, you can put it. You can put a tax on many, many things. Uh, with in some cases, it might be tricky because uh, water. So say that you have water as a resource, uh, and you want to put a tax on the consumption of water as a resource. You can do that in an urban setting, like the city, you could say we'll raise the price of water, but when it comes into the countryside, it may be difficult to put a, a tax on water. Uh, I'm not knowing, I don't know if anybody said this, by the way, but it's hard to put a tax on water that farmers are using um, if the farmers are, for example, taking water out of a river. What you would need to do in some ways is limit the amount of water they can take out of a river, which is a cap, and then allow them to uh, uh, get some permits to remove water from the river then you would have uh, a cap and trade where there would be a market where they would either buy the permit to take water out of the river uh, or they would get permits and they'd be able to trade them among themselves. I'm not saying that anybody did this, but that would be a market kind of mechanism. If you wanted to, like I said in class uh, a, couple, a couple classes ago, if you want to put a tax on groundwater withdrawals, like I mentioned as an idea, that's fine. That is a government policy that is putting a price on water, that is raising the price of water, that's gonna reduce water consumption. With things like coal and gasoline and uh, new, whatever, wind power, all those things, those are much easier just to say, raise the price and the consumption will fall, right? That's a price, that's a pure price mechanism. Now, when it comes to environmental uh, uh, goods, it's more difficult to, um, to uh, do this kind of work. Someone spilled their coffee all the way up there. 
It's more difficult to do this kind of work, uh, but the gov and, and in some ways because the environment is, is not a private good. The environment is a uh, more or less uh, either a public good or a commons. It's a non-excludable good. And the government must be involved. In some ways, this, is, this was the most important part of the assignment, was to talk about how the government could get involved in the environment. And uh, to, to talk, what I want to talk about then is um, the, most, uh, the, most common, the most, two most common ways of uh, regulating uh, environmental quality. Uh, more or less, it's, again, it's a, a, a economic ways. There's three ways. The, f the first one is a form of a regulation, right? If you say uh, people cannot drive their cars on, on, on whatever Thursday, then that's a regulation that will clean the air quality because there's no, or there, it'll improve air quality. Uh, it's not a price-based idea. Another regulation will say uh, your car has to, every car has to have three people in it. Two people, no. One person, we shoot you, right? That's a regulation. It works, right? Oh my God, my car's full of people. In, in California, where people have a lot, there's more lawyers than people, uh, there, is a, there was this carpool lane, you know, like a, 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 you have to have two people in the car, and number one, the people with the inflatable dummy, they take their girlfriend with them in the car, that didn't count. So they, did, they tried that, uh, saying I have my best friend with me, and then, but a woman did win a lawsuit saying that because she was pregnant, she was actually uh, carrying uh, two people in the car. Um, so there's a, there's a lawyer for everything in California. Uh, but that's a regulation saying you have to have two people in the car to go somewhere. Um, and, and why is that? That's because we want to either reduce the congestion, because we want to have fewer cars, or because we want to have uh, fewer cars that are putting out uh, less local and global pollutants, right? So that's a form of a regulation. Again, not a market mechanism. If they were saying, we will um, only allow cars on the road if you pay a toll, that's a toll charge. That's a market mechanism because it uses a price. Uh, if they, you know, there's all kinds of examples of that. So let's talk about cap and trade. And uh, I want to make this into kind of a general discussion of cap and trade, which is relevant to not just China, but also to the world, especially when it comes to carbon discussions. Um, and I want to compare it to a carbon tax, which is um, a diff an alternative which I personally prefer uh, in many ways to cap and trade. Uh, but it's not necessarily adopted. One of the biggest exceptions is, is of course, British Columbia, which has a carbon tax, which is, uh, in my mind, phenomenally successful. Uh, and, not, and, and the fact that it's not talked about worldwide is, I think, uh, crazy, but also maybe part of a lobbying effort to not talk about carbon taxes. So we'll get into that in a little bit. So let's talk about the easy one, or the hard one, cap and trade. And cap and trade can occur for many things. It, it can occur for water. It, it can occur for carbon. Uh, it can occur for uh, land. Um, it can occur for, for many different uh, uh, resources, whether or not they have an environmental impact. So carbon is uh, almost purely environmental. Water is both a resource and an environmental good. Uh, land is uh, a resource and it's not necessarily environmental at all, right? So cap and trade is a, just a, it's a simple, it's, a, it's a, an idea which is very simple uh, and we use it all the time. Um, the, the land market in, in, in Vancouver is a form, has a form of cap and trade. You've got the, you've got, Vancouver's got this crazy shape, but you've got, you know, over here you've got the, the West End and downtown. And uh, up here, you've got North Van and East Van or West Van or whatever. And then you've got down here, you've got the suburbs and all that. Over here we are at good old SFU. But in a sense, the land itself of Vancouver is limited. There's a cap, right? You can't, I mean, you, you could maybe build, you know, islands off into the middle of, the, of the, the Fraser River and so on. But there is a cap. There's not that much land. And when people buy and sell real estate from each other, it's trading, cap and trade. That's how complicated it is, or it isn't. It's very simple, okay? So cap and trade more or less says there's a limited supply and we're gonna trade it among our, each other. And in trading, we are going to maximize the value. If I end up with a piece of land and I would rather have money than, and you would rather have the land, then you give me money, I give you the land. That is a trade that's mutually beneficial. And from a social perspective, it's socially beneficial as well because the land is ending up with, in someone's hands and ownership who values it more. Uh, there is a presumption that someone who's willing to pay 
uh, should have that land compared to someone who is not willing to pay uh, or who would rather have the money. Uh, that um, presumption is usually st uh, true, usually strong, but it can be, it can be uh, overcome. There can be mistakes in that kind of presumption. So what happens when you have a cap and trade uh, system is that you, you put a limit on whatever's out there and then uh, the people are allowed to trade it. Um, let's use a particular example. I'll start with something easy, water, and say that we have, say that you're all farmers and uh, whatever, there's, there's, uh, there's 60 of you and um, in aggregate, this is your demand curve for water. And there's a limited amount of water. There's a limited amount of water that's a sustainable amount of water. Uh, but because of the past uh, government policies or whatever, the actual consumption of water is here. So this is a su supply sustainable. This is a supply unsustainable. So what you have here is a gap, which is um, a problem. I'll use my economic terminology. So uh, you're taking too much water, uh, unsustainable quantities of water from the river, from groundwater, doesn't matter, taking too much. And uh, for one reason or another, you as a community, in fact, decide it's not a good idea to take that much water. There's so much water going out that the spring that provides the drinking water to your village has, is, is, is dropping, right? The spring is not there anymore, or the well that you get drinking water from is dropping. There's not enough water in the well. So there is a negative impact, a negative externality of your water consumption. And you as a village all come together and say, okay, we're going to limit how much water we use. We're going to put a cap on it at the sustainable number. doesn't matter how you come at the cap. You just put a cap on it. The important thing, of course, is that you can change the cap as time goes by. But right now, you just set a, a, a cap on it. Now, the problem is, uh, okay, who's going to get water and who isn't? And there's many different ways to do it. One way to say is, if you got to use it last year, you get to use it this year, uh, but you only get to use 80%. So let's say that over here, let's say that there were... Uh, 180 units of water, and this is 120 units, which is where you want to go. So roughly two, so right now you've got 60 farmers, they're using 180, uh, they're using 180 units, but you want to drop it to 120 units. And there's two ways to look at how to do the, how to, to how to, so setting the cap is, is the, the easy part. The easy part is to set the cap. Okay? We already know, for example, with climate change, how much carbon can go in the atmosphere. Everybody knows. All the scientists have calculated it 20 million times. We know the cap. How to allocate portions into the cap is the hard part. That's the political part. So what we say is, there's, there's two ways, there's several ways to do this. One is, uh, so prior so how, how, this is how to allocate. Question mark, right? One is prior use. Prior use is you used three units last year, and we have to cut it down by one third, so you get two units this year. But you used two units this year, so you only get one and a third units this year, right? You get two thirds of, of last year's. So if you had if you had three, that's going to go to two. If you had two, that's going to go to uh, two-thirds of that, which is going to be four-thirds. If you had one, then you're going to get two-thirds of a unit. Clear enough? Okay, everybody gets reduced by the same amount. Another way to do it is to say uh, oldest used. And that's going to be uh, I started using two units in 1990, and you started using three units in uh, 1995. So, and let's say that, I'm going to put this in another place. I'm going to put it in another place to make it easier. Oldest use, 
I take all the farmers here and I say, okay, we got farmer one, two, three, four, five, and I order you guys in terms of how long you've been using the water. So the number one person started using water in 1960. They started using two units of water. The other one said 1960. They were using three units of water. 1961, they were using one unit of water, blah, 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 blah. And you go all the way down here to the, we got 60 farmers. The 60th farmer uh, in uh, 2012 started using four units of water. And so on. Now, as in terms of record keeping, this is not very different from, from, from this. This only goes back one year, or on average five years, whatever it is. But this one goes all the way back to the start. But the record keeping is very similar, right? I need to know how much you've been using. In both cases, I need to know how much you've been using. This actually is a very tricky thing to do with water, because maybe you just tell me how much you're using. Ooh, that's a big problem, right? You might lie. But let's just say that there are records. So we've got records, and here's what happens is, as I go down this list and I get to 120 as the summation, there's a cutoff. And the cutoff might be farmer 42, who used one unit in whatever it was, 1999, right? So anybody who started farming after 1999, anybody who started diverting water, started diverting water after 1999, no water. Everybody is cut off. You don't get any of these 120 units. That is based on oldest use, right? In, in another way of saying that is first in time, first in right, okay? Now, this is, this, by the way, this conversation with water is going to be very similar to almost every cap and trade, including climate change, so keep this in mind. Carbon. So you can say, how much were you using last year before we put the cap in, or in the previous five years, or whatever? What's the oldest use, which is how long ago did you start? And we will give you priority if you're the oldest user. And this is the allocation of the units of, of rights in water, the, the right to use the water. We're still on the cap part. This is important. We haven't gotten to the trade. We're only on the cap part. Another one is going to say uh, proportional use. Oh, sorry. Uh, prior use. Prior use ended up being uh, proportional. So this was divi dividing it proportionally, which is the same, which is, that's, that's fine. Let's leave it like that. What, is there any other way that you can think of that might make sense in terms of Allocation. Maybe the biggest user gets none, and the smallest user gets some. Lottery. Um, good one. So we do the lottery, and the, the, the people who, who have the winning, the first 60 winning numbers, or first 120 winning numbers, you get units, and other people don't. Lottery is a good way to do it. It's considered uh, fair. But on, on the other hand, all of these are considered fair. This is the biggest problem. They're all fair, right? Oh, but last year I, I used five units, and you should just give me, because I, I, I have my plants, my crops, and I'm used to that. It's like, oh, but wait, my grandfather came here in 1960, blah, 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 right? So there's all of these are fair according to where you stand, right? On the other hand, they are all fair uh, uh, objectively in a way because you're just allocating units. It's, it's a little bit, you know, who, who, who deserves these rights? It's hard to, hard to say. Lottery. Uh, and the fourth one is uh, nobody gets anything. I'll get to that in a second. Any other ideas besides these four? That's number four. Don't preempt me. Another one. That was my best idea. You just End of my lecture. Okay, any other ideas? Okay, good. So yes, no one gets any. So what that means basically is that uh, you know you're the mayor, and you get 100. You're the honest mayor. You get 120 permits, and you put them on the table. Actually, it's really easy because everybody knows if you're going to be a crook, right? So you put them on. I, you put them on the table and say, okay, now we're going to have an auction, and if you want to buy a unit, you have to bid. And if you bid $10 and he bids $12 and he bids $15, you're, st you're not winning any units. You're like, okay, I'll bid $20. It's like, okay, but she's like, 
Uh, I'll bid $50. So now you have an auction, right? And there's lots of ways of, of, of doing auctions. Um, because this is a very important topic to me, I'll, I'll, I'll mention this to you as a way of doing the auction. Um, there's two kinds of auctions. One of them is to say, if you bid 15, and you bid 20, and you bid 5, or whatever, and the cutoff, the, 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 the lowest, I've got to sell 120 units, right? So I take the, the, hot, the top 120 bids. And let's say 5 doesn't win, because the minimum, the lowest bid of the 120 is 8. Let's say 8. That means you pay 15, because you bid 15, and you pay 10. So one type of auction is you pay what you bid. And uh, so you pay more than you for the, for the same water. This is called a discriminatory auction, right? The problem with that auction is what? If you know you're going to pay what you bid, what's the problem? That's one kind of a problem, but that's not, exa that's not the, I'm actually, I'm talking about the problem, that's a good, that is a problem. That's a problem in terms of, um, a little bit in terms of economic efficiency, because they're, they're, it's the same water, but the price is changing from place to place. The profitability will change all over the place because the input's changing. That's one issue, which is a good one, but that's not what I'm getting at. What's the problem with bidding when you have to pay what you bid? You don't want to, you want to kind of shade your bid down. It's te technically, it's called shading. You shade your bid down. Say, well, I really want to pay 20. It's worth 30. I could pay 20, but I don't want to pay 20. How about I pay 15, right? So what, what happens is people just kind of lower their bids. And, and, and what happens on the margin is that you bid, uh, you know, you got 20, 18, uh, 15. And say that it was, it's, this is the bid, and this is the value. And so the value is, say, this person is, say, it's worth 20. This person says, it's worth 25, but I'll bid 18. This person says, uh, turn that off. Is that me? Whoever did that, turn that off. Uh, and this person says, oh, it's worth 20, uh, it's worth um, 15 to me. What am I doing here? Right, oh, 20. Make this, uh, make this worth 30. So if the person, if the, if the one is worth 30, but they bid 15 because they don't want to pay too much, and then the cutoff price ends up being $18. Then the guy's like, it was worth 30 to me. I totally would have bid more than $18, right? Oh, it's not fair. Oh, lawsuits. Call the lawyers in California, right? So what happens is if, you're, if, you're, if it's a pay as you bid, the shading results in these games, and the games end up screwing everything up because some people get the water who shouldn't have the water. Some people... Uh, a bid less than they would value it or whatever. So the way to get around this in terms of uh, an auction is to, um, to take all the bids. We've got, uh, we've got bids of 20, 18, 15, la, 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 la. We have 120 bids. And we've got 5, 5, 4, et cetera. Uh, and all the way up to 45, who cares? You have 120 bids, and you, and you cut it off, and you say, okay, this, these 120 bids, the, the highest 120 bids are the winning bids, because they're high, but they all pay one price. They all pay one price based on the, the highest rejected bid. And what that means is that if you bid 45, you're pretty sure you're not going to pay 45, but you're also sure you're not going to lose the auction, right? So you bid 45, and then if the price is 12, you pay 12. If the price is, is, is 30, it's 30, right? In terms of economics, in terms of, in terms of what are called incentive-compatible mechanisms, mechanisms, which is what this is, this is incentive-compatible because there's no reason why you shouldn't bid the value to you. If it's worth 20, bid 20. You'll end up paying either 20, or you won't win because the price has gone up to 25, which is okay, or you pay less than 20 because someone else, there's more bids that are below you. Right? So that's incentive compatible in terms of revealing the truth of your, of your, uh, of your, uh, of your, it's, it's, it reveals the truth of your value and it allocates the water to people who have the highest value.
if, they, if, if you bid more than your true value, you're not going to be in business very long. Right? It's, it's, it's possible, right? And I, I've run laboratory experiments with people that are doing this. And the worst case is they say, I'm bidding too much because I want one just so I can have one. And, and that maybe in the laboratory, that's OK. But when you go out in the, and, and this is $20,000, then people should be a little bit more serious about how much they bid. So in the one hand, uh, you might bid too much according to your value. You lose money because you're not really good at business, apparently. Right? So it's not going to be the first time you've made this mistake. On the other hand, if you just bid what you, what you think is correct, then you're going, to, uh, uh, you're going to win if you have a higher bid, and you'll pay a price that's based on the highest rejected price. Right? This, by the way, is how eBay auctions work. But at eBay, you're only buying one unit of an item. I don't know, um, Alibaba, what's the big one in China that does auction? Is, it, is there an auction site in China? What's it called? Tabao. OK. And is that one used? So when you bid on that, so here's what happens. I have an iPhone on there. And I bid on eBay, I bid uh, $200. And someone else bids $190 at the end of the auction. There's all kinds of crap at the end of the auction. Anyway, someone else bids $190. I bid $200. On eBay, I pay $191. Right? I win because I have a $200 bid but I pay a price which is based on the price right below me. That's how eBay works. So they're taking, this is called a second price auction. So the one here, this is a 120th price auction, right? Or 121st price auction. But eBay uses a second price auction and, and that's where this idea is borrowed from. It's easier to allocate this way to the people who, based on their value. So we could do the, so that's how we could auction the water, right? In this uh, example here. We could say, nobody gets any water. We're just going to auction it. And then you're the mayor. You take all the revenue, and you use it to um, many different ways to do it. One is that every villager gets some of the revenue, because it's the village's water. The other one is the village has decided to spend the revenue on uh, a new uh, water system for drinking water, or they've decided to build it on a dam. There's a million ways to spend the money. The money is gone. Do you have a question? Right. 190? One, 190 is 191. It's, they, they add a little bit, but it could, it's, based on, it's based on this price. OK, we pay 190. It's fine with me. But I don't sell you my phone. That's fine. You're right. Uh, it could be 190. It could be. It's something based on that bid. It's not based on my bid. It's based on their bid. That's the key idea. 190 is the easiest thing to use. Yeah. Aha! Uh -huh, you bid 500. That's fine, you can do that. But if someone bids 499 and you win, you pay 499. <laughs> so you can bid crazy, but you have to pay crazy sometimes, right? If you if you if so if you bid crazy and he's bidding crazy also, you're in trouble. Right? <laughs> Screw you up. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it, it wouldn't be the first time, right? I mean, yeah. Not not that you guys are doing this to each other, but like this happens all the time on on eBay or whatever. Um, it's, but that's, I mean, the, the, anyway, that's, that's how that works. So you can, you can allocate prior use, oldest use, lottery, some other way. Now, from an economic perspective, we haven't gotten to trading yet, right? From an economic perspective, it doesn't matter how you allocate as long as you do allocate, and then you allow a market, okay? Let's just say I choose this half of the room to get all the water, and you guys get none of the water. Now we're going to have a market, and you'll say, oh my god, I need water for my, for my grapes, or for my orange tree, or for my lettuce, or whatever, my rabbit, whatever it is. And, and you guys will be like, well, uh, I've got water. I can, plant, I can use it on my own crops, or I can make some money selling it to you. Right? So this is the sell side. This is the buy side. The water will be reallocated around the room with some losses, efficiency losses, based on transaction costs. Right? Transaction costs might mean that you know, 
you stand up and you try and sell some water, and then you stand up and try and sell some water. So there's lots of different ways of, of, real, of, real, of trading the water. There's lots of different ways to do that. Guess what? Another auction, right? Uh, or you have a, a market, or you say, oh, I, I ran into you on the street. Let me buy some water from you. There's a million different ways to do it. The transaction costs, you want to minimize the transaction costs to maximize the number of trades among the various people. Okay? That's uh, a known problem. But the key issue here is not how trading would work, it's who wins and who loses under every one of these systems. Right? A lottery is fair in the sense that everybody has an equal chance of getting it. An auction is a lot less fair because you have to bid to get it, but on the other hand, the auction kind of takes care of the trading problem. Right? Because the initial allocation will be very close to people's values. Oldest and prior use, oldest use, like I'm old, I've been doing this for a long time, I deserve it. You don't deserve it, you've only been here since the old example that was there. 2012, you only started watering. Right? So everybody has their own story about what is fair. Ultimately what that means is that uh, somebody's going to make money. Each of these systems means more money for some people than other people. And, and this becomes a very huge political discussion. Very, very difficult discussion because so much money is going to be at stake. If I give you guys all the water rights, wow, congratulations, you have all this water, you guys have got to give them money just to get water that they got for free. So they'll say, oh, I hate this idea. What we should do is uh, prior use because you've been using the water. Last year you used a whole bunch of water. He was the big farmer, used 30 units of water last year and he would get 20 units and he would be the big water seller, right? So he'll argue for private use. You guys will argue for uh, the, the giving half to you, except if I put the other half on the, on the other side of the room, you say, oh, no, 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 half is wrong, half is wrong, we should do lottery, right? Because of the amount of money being transferred back and forth. Does that make sense? You see how that's a, a big hot topic politically? If we expand this to uh, climate change and carbon, let's talk about, let's see, uh, oldest use is uh, I'm going to call it, well basically, let's just say, to make it easy, the United States. The U.S. has been putting, and England of course, started the Industrial Revolution. So U.K. and the U.S. are huge users of carbon for over a hundred years, right? Prior use starts to recognize, for example, China, uh, because in, if we started this cap and trade worldwide right now, China is now one of the biggest carbon users in the world, uh, but also up there with the U.S. Right? Lottery means that, and this is the rights. Who gets the rights? Who gets the rights? China and the U.S. Here's the U.S. and the U.K. gets the rights. Uh, the lottery means Africa comes in here and says, oh, wow, we've got you know, a lot of people and not much carbon, so we get a lot more rights. None of the above means that everybody has to buy their rights from some market. So if we're doing carbon permits in terms of a cap and trade, and we allocate them in one of these four different ways, you can see very quickly that some countries are going to be very excited about an idea and some are worse. The other, the other version of the lottery is population, which, which puts China back in, but also India and so on, right? So if you have a lottery, say every citizen on the planet gets some, some carbon, what's going to happen is uh, you know, 1.3 billion Chinese, one, over a billion Indians, uh, a bunch of people in Africa, 800 million people in Africa, they're all going to get these permits and you know, the United States will be, and Canada especially, will say, holy cow, now we've got to go buy, <laughs> holy carbon, we have to go buy a bunch of carbon uh, from these guys. We've been using carbon for all these years. We have a right. We have a right. You shouldn't make us buy this. But on the other hand, these people say, well, we have just the same right. Every system is just as fair as the other one but the money flows are totally different. This is why there is no global cap and trade regime. No doubt. Because some people don't want to pay other people and they're always the same people who don't want to pay everybody else. Like you, if you literally say, we'll do this, they like it. And if we say, oh, you're not that, you're this, this half of the room gets the permits. I love that idea if you're on this half of the room. This half of the room gets the permits. I hate this idea if I'm this half of the room. People are going to change their answers depending on how much money they're making. And in some ways, it's not even the citizens who are being asked this question, but the political leaders, right? Because the, uh, the cost of addressing climate change is still extremely low 
uh, compared to uh, the damages that are going to result. But politicians are not willing to, to give that up, and so they do nothing, and so we're all screwed. So that's my depressing lecture today. In fact, that is my depressing lecture today. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, that's cap and trade. We know how the, that's how the cap is set. That was a very important point. That's how trading occurs. Uh, and I'll get into all the games around climate change later, but now you know what mechanisms should be in the briefings when you're doing your grading. Okay, 